Good evening, church family. Welcome to the Midweek Oasis service. We thank you and welcome those who are joining online via YouTube. Pastor Claude is still a bit under the weather, so uh, I do encourage you guys, be praying for Pastor Claude, be praying for us here at the church. Uh, we could really use it. We've been going through a season of trial the past few weeks, but the Lord has been so faithful to be getting us through it and be blessing us along the way. But we do desire that you continue to pray for us, that the Lord would continue to move among us, that he would restore us and give us his power. So why don't we pray tonight before we get into the study? Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. Wherever we may be, we know you are there with us because your spirit dwells within us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear your word tonight. I pray, Father, that you would use me, that you would fill me with your power, that you would anoint the words that come out of my mouth, that they might be your words, Lord. I pray for all those who are listening in tonight. Father, would you move upon our hearts? Would you teach us more about who you are, what you desire from us? Lord, we desire to please you, but we know that we can't do it apart from you. So we ask you to bless our night, bless our study. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, everybody. So what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be taking a look at the book of Leviticus. And I know you might be thinking, Leviticus, that's the book that when I do my Bible through the year plan, I have a hard time with that one. I usually get to it and it's just talking about sacrifices and tabernacles and offerings and all sorts of things that we in 21st century culture are fairly disconnected from. We don't really get to see or witness what a sacrifice or an offering of an animal looks like. So when we read about it, we have a bit of a, a disconnect. But regardless, I know it can be difficult sometimes to read through the book of Leviticus, but we have an encouragement. In the book of Hebrews chapter 8, we are told that the things in the law, things like the tabernacle and the sacrifices, they were a shadow of the heavenly things, a shadow of the true sanctuary and what actually was happening with Jesus. And we can see him through these things. Now, the book of Colossians talks about how new moons and feasts and Sabbaths were a shadow of things to come, but the, the body or the fullness is of Christ. You know, uh, I remember being a kid, and on a field trip for school, we went to the, uh, the Wax Museum in New York City. I think it's Madame Tussaud. Forgive me if I got that wrong. It's been a long time. But you go into this Wax Museum, and there are these wax dummies of celebrities, famous artists, all sorts of people, and they are extremely lifelike. But you know, you go up to them, and the closer you get, the more you can really tell that things aren't exactly correct, there are certain things off. And you might think, what's the point in going in there and you know, can you really gain anything from staring at a copy of an actual human being? And although when I went up to the, the mannequin of Arnold Schwarzenegger, I, you know, I didn't really hear the tone of his voice because it didn't speak, and I didn't really get his autograph because it couldn't move. Regardless, I was able to see certain things about the man that without looking at the copy, I may never have known. I saw how tall he was. I saw the color of his hair, the build of his physique. You know, there are certain characteristics and traits that I was able to discern even though it was a copy. You know, because I saw that, I think if I did see somebody posing as Arnold Schwarzenegger on the street, I'd be able to tell that that wasn't really him. And then I think if I saw him, although he might be a little older than when they made that model, I think I'd be able to absolutely say, wow, I, that, that's the real thing because I was able to have some time with the copy. So as we look back into the book of Leviticus, we're seeing that shadow, that copy of the true things, things that represented Jesus. So I encourage us to, with all of our heart and our mind, commit ourselves to seeing him tonight. So if you would, turn with me to Leviticus chapter 6. <clears throat> We're going to be taking a look at only a few verses tonight, verses 8 through 13. And it says in Le Leviticus 6, 8, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron 
and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the, on the hearth upon the altar all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. We're going to pause there for a second just so we can get some context. This is the law pertaining to what was known as the burnt offering. Now, to get a fuller understanding of what exactly the burnt offering was, we're going to take a look in the book of Exodus, chapter 29, verse 38. We'll read a few verses there. It says, Now this is what you shall offer on the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to, their, uh, to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And we see this is where the Lord established the burnt offering. And there were certain aspects of a burnt offering. A burnt offering was something that was a free will offering. You as a worshiper of God could bring an ox or a lamb or a turtle dove or flower or anything like that and bring it to the priest who would then sacrifice or kill the animal for you. Actually, you would kill the animal. They would butcher it and they'd place it on the altar. Underneath the altar would be a fire burning and the, the body of that animal would be burned completely. There wouldn't be any meal to be eaten. Some offerings, like the peace offering, the person who brought the animal and the priest would share in a meal, almost like a, a barbecue. And you know, they would be, partake of the worship in that fashion. But the burnt offering was wholly consumed by the fire. The only person who received anything out of the burnt offering was God himself. And it says that the burnt offering was a sweet-smelling aroma before God. You know, uh, I don't know if you're big into barbecuing, but if you are, I tell my wife this all the time, there's a reason that this is called a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. If you've ever grilled a burger or a steak, or if you're here on Saturday mornings, we grill up some bacon, when meat is cooking, it does release a fragrance that to us is quite sweet, quite savory. It's something that smells attractive as opposed to a foul odor. Uh, it's appetizing. It's pleasing. And the Lord, when there's a burnt sacrifice going on, that aroma that men can smell is supposed to represent what God is experiencing from the worship. God doesn't care so much about the actual barbecue. <laughs> I don't think God is up in heaven going, oh boy, another steak. Oh, I can't wait to smell that. No, God doesn't get any physical pleasure like that from the aroma, but it's from the worship itself because it was offered freely to him in accordance with his desires and the law. It was done in obedience, and it was something that pleased him. And as it filled the air with a fragrance, it could be recognized that it was also pleasing to God. These sacrifices, specifically these two lambs, were offered every single day. And I want us to think about this, how many lambs, must have been slaughtered throughout a year. It's two lambs every day, and that's just the daily required burnt offerings. Every morning, one lamb was to be taken, slaughtered, butchered, put on the hearth or the grate on the altar, and then burned on the fire until it was nothing left of it but ashes. And then in the evening, before the sun went down, 
Another lamb was taken in the same fashion, butchered, put on the hearth, and it was burned as well. And we see that at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, there was worship before the Lord. And this was pleasing to God. It was something that he required. And we see here in the book of Leviticus, God explaining kind of the procedures on what to do with the leftovers, what to do with the ashes, what to do with the fire. And as we see, it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his son saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth upon the altar all night until morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. You know, I want us to think about that for a second. That lamb that was offered at night, it was left burning all night. You know, picture what you might see if you were there amongst the Israelites as the priest offers that lamb at twilight as the sun's going down and it's getting dark. And you can see through the door of the tabernacle where the altar is. And even though it might be pitch black outside, you can still see the fire burning. You can still be comforted knowing that there is worship between man and God going on and that it's, it's pleasing to him. What comfort there must be knowing that there's a sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God burning throughout the darkest time of the day. You know, church, I said you can see Jesus in these things. And truly, we see right there is a lamb in the morning. There's a lamb at night. There's the first lamb. There's the last lamb. And throughout the day, any day in Israel, there would be a myriad of other offerings and sacrifices brought freely by the people to the Lord. But they were couched in between that first and last sacrifice. And truly, Jesus is the first and last ultimate sacrifice. It, without Jesus dying on the cross, there would be no, no opportunity for us to offer any sort of offering or sacrifice to God. Our worship would be meaningless because we would still, to this day, be enemies of God. So we can see that all of our worship that we would do here on a Sunday or on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday or any day of the week when we might be at home or here at the church, we offer worship and it's acceptable to God through Jesus Christ because of what he did on our behalf, opening the doors of the sanctuary, tearing the veil and giving us access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And we can see this represented here that in between the first and the last lamb, all the other worship took place. And you know, even right now, Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. You know, you might be thinking, I know there are some times that Christians think that God might be done with them. And maybe that's you, you know, as you're listening in tonight. You think that you have sinned one too many times, that maybe God's grace is out, it's, it's up, it's used. There's none left for you. If only you hadn't sinned this last time, maybe God's wrath wouldn't come upon you. But I tell you, you might be in a dark place in your life, but there is still a sacrifice that God looks to that is well-pleasing to him and fully sufficient even in the darkest times in our life. It's the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood is fully sufficient. When God looks upon his blood, he remembers that our sin was paid for, covered, that his wrath was fully satisfied. And I'm comforted knowing that even at this very moment, if I were to sin, if I confess that sin to God, coming to him humbly and I repent, there would be a sacrifice that is still to this day sufficient to cover me. The precious blood of Jesus, that blood that we sing about in the songs that we sing, the blood that we plead over our lives and we know with full assurance that we are saved and set free from the wrath that we deserve. It's wonderful to know that there is a sacrifice always before God. We see here something else besides just the meat of the sacrifice. And this is gonna really be the focus of what we're gonna be looking over today in that the very final sentence of verse uh, nine there, 
It says, upon the altar all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. I want us to look a little bit at this idea of the fire of the altar. It says here that the fire was to be kept burning always on the altar. It was never allowed to go out. And you, you might think that that's a little, a little strange. Why couldn't they just start a new fire? You know, as I was, excuse me, preparing for this message, I, uh, I went online and I looked up what is fire. <laughs> very elementary thing to do. You know what? I, you just don't think about it very often. You go throughout your day and you think as an adult, yeah, yeah I, I know what fire is, you know. <laughs> then if a child were to ask you, hey, what is fire? You just say, yeah, it's the, the, it's the fire. So I did a little, little elementary school research on what is fire. Fire is a chemical reaction between oxygen and some sort of fuel. There's three components that cause what we see as fire. There's the oxygen, the fuel, and then there's heat. And what takes place is interesting. When the fuel, which could be wood, it could be uh, oil, it could be gasoline, it could be anything like that, when that fuel reaches a specific temperature, it has a chemical reaction with the oxygen and does something known as combust. And combustion is what we really call fire. It's that flame that we see. It's that heat that we feel. And fire, when you really think about it, fire is energy being released from this chemical reaction in the forms of light and heat. It's power. You know, in the Bible, fire is used uh, various different ways. There's practical uses for fire. Fire was... Uh, in biblical times, the, the light, besides things like the sun and the moon at night, you would use fire. An oil lamp would burn and it would cast light. And that was one practical use for fire. And we, we know that metaphorically, God talks to us about his word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. You know, fire was also used as a symbol in the Old Testament as uh, a sign of God's judgment, his uh, wrath or of coming destruction. We can see in various verses, like Lamentations uh, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, He has cut off in fierce anger every horn of Israel. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. He has blazed against Jacob like a flaming fire devouring all around. In Ezekiel 21, 31, it says, I will pour out my indignation on you. I will blow against you with the fire of my wrath and deliver you into the hands of brutal men who are skilled to destroy. Fire was also used in biblical times as a weapon of war. If you were conquering a city, sometimes you would just set the city on fire to defeat it. Say they barricaded themselves in and you were besieging the city. You could very easily just try to throw a couple torches or flaming arrows over the walls and hope to catch something that would combust and set the city on fire, defeating your enemies. And we see the Lord commanded Israel to use fire in this manner, to destroy the things of the people when they were entering into the promised land. In Deuteronomy 7, 5, it says, but thus you shall deal with them, talking about the inhabitants of the land. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. So we see Fire was a weapon. Fire was a tool. Fire represented God's anger and his wrath and, his, and the coming destruction that he would send. But you know, in the Old Testament, there's also a very prevalent use for fire. Fire represented God's power and his presence among the people. In Deuteronomy 9.3, God says, Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. You know, in Exodus, we see God represent himself to Moses in the burning bush passage. It says in Exodus 3, 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And we know the story. Moses, intrigued by this, this burning bush that wouldn't turn to ash, it just kept burning. He's intrigued and he decides to go and check out what 
that could possibly be. And we know that when he gets there, God speaks to him. He has an encounter with the Lord where he receives uh, his mission to go and set the people of Israel free from Pharaoh. And we see that in the burning bush, the presence and power of God was represented. And that's not the last time we see God's power and his presence represented in a flame of fire. When the children of Israel were delivered out of the land of Egypt, and they went to Mount Sinai and stood before the mountain where Moses would go up and receive the covenant and the laws and all of the commands from God about how to worship him and how to live, it says that their first experience with God was really an interesting one. In Exodus, I think, 18 it is. It talks about how, oh, Exodus 19, 18. It talks about how the people saw the mountain shaking and smoking, and there was thunder and lightning, and it was a quite, really quite terrifying sight, and the people were so afraid. Even Moses says that, it says that Moses trembled at the sight of that, that smoking, flaming mountain. And it says in Exodus 19, 18, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And we see that when the people saw God, they saw him in fire, his power and his presence represented before them in that way. And we see that throughout their entire wilderness journey, 40 years in the wilderness, God re uh, represented his presence with the people in two ways. By day, it was a cloud, uh, a pillar of cloud, and at night, it was a pillar of fire. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 19, gives us a, a kind of an overview of these things, of how the Jews remembered it. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way that they should go. And we see in the Old Testament that for 40 years, God represented to the people his power and his presence through fire. Even when it's, uh, fire is used in reference to God's wrath, it's to represent his power. And, you know, we spoke a little bit about the practical uses of fire, weapons, tools. Fire was used to refine gold. It was a means of purification. Fire had many uses, but to the people, the idea of a pillar of fire, God's presence and God's power. We see into the New Testament that God's power is often represented in the person of the Holy Spirit in relationship to fire. You know, John the Baptist, when he was talking about Jesus, he spoke of his own mission and he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there is one among you. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we see this in Acts chapter 2, when the, the 120 believers are gathered together after the ascension of Jesus, and they're praying, and they're in one accord and one mind, and Pentecost takes place, and the Spirit of God descends upon them. And how is he represented among them? His power was represented as cloven tongues of fire resting upon each one. Jesus truly did baptize with fire and with the Spirit. And in that fire, God's power is represented. And we see in Leviticus chapter 6 this idea of the altar. I think it can rightly be looked at, and we can take that as an image of the Holy Spirit's work, the power of of God. You know, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, we'll look at actually verse 13, a little bit before that. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. Did you catch that in verse 14? It says that Jesus, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who, uh, who through the eternal spirit, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God. You know, you don't often think about that, that Jesus offered himself through the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, it shouldn't shock us. The Holy Spirit, uh, he enabled Jesus' ministry. Jesus did nothing outside of what the Father said, did, and what the Spirit empowered. You know, Jesus, his miracles were powered by the Holy, empowered by the Holy Spirit. When he was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him and remained upon him. So we see in Leviticus chapter 6 and from Exodus 29, this, this concept of the burnt offering. You know, if you think about it, you could have the lamb, you could have the heart. You could sacrifice the lamb, shed its blood. You could butcher it perfectly. The priest could really do his job, be wearing the right clothes, take all of the pieces, arrange them perfectly, the fat, the entrails, the fat above the kidneys, all of these little details that God gave. You could do it all perfectly, but you wouldn't have a burnt offering if there was not fire. And you know, folks, I think about what we do for God sometimes. You know, that fire was the vehicle for the offering to, to uh, be offered to God. It was through the fire that what would normally, if left to its own, be rotting meat, spoiled meat and molding flour, those things through the fire and the power of it were converted into a burnt offering that was pleasing to God. And I think about our own works and the things that we do for God, our lives, how outside of the fire of the Spirit and the power of God, that resides in us through the Holy Spirit himself, that if we try to work outside of his enabling and outside of his power, really those things, they can't please God. How could they? They really will just be rotting meat, smelling carcass. It won't be a, a sweet aroma to the Lord. It'll be a foul odor. To think that in your own strength, you could serve the Lord well in any fashion, I think is foolishness. It would be as foolish as offering a burnt offering and not having any fire. It wouldn't accomplish what you're hoping that it would because without that one ingredient to the whole procedure, that flame, the burnt offering cannot become a burnt offering. If you look now in Leviticus chapter nine, just to really solidify this idea that the fire represented in the altar is a representation of the Holy Spirit and God's power. I want us to look in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 22 to the end of the chapter, so we can see where this fire that was going to be burning continually underneath the altar came from. It says, Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. You know, we're given here in Leviticus chapter nine, the supernatural event that took place when this was the first time the, the uh, burnt offering was being offered. This is when the priestly ministry was beginning. And we see that, remember, that fire was required for these burnt offerings. And Aaron was not told, go and grab two sticks and rub them together as hard as you possibly can until you make fire. He wasn't told, go find some gasoline at the nearest gas station and light a match and go start some fire, Aaron. Instead, Aaron ordered the sacrifices and God himself provided the fire. You know, we might have desires in our heart to serve the Lord, and that's good. That should all be in order. But unless we pray that God would empower us through his spirit, those things will never become a sweet-smelling aroma and offering to the Lord. As we go back to chapter 6, Remember, we're told this fire was to be maintained. And we're going to see this several other times in the next few verses, this concept of the fire never being allowed to be put out. And I want us to really think, how does fire continue to burn? We know the origin of this fire under the altar was supernatural. God sent it, but then he told the people, the priests, that they had to maintain it. You know, there are a few things fire needs to be maintained. It needs fuel and it needs oxygen. 
The flames produce the heat on a perpetual basis. But without fuel, the fire is going to stop. And we see that uh, in this fire, the priests would have to take some wood. And each morning, they'd have to go and put some wood underneath and keep the flames going, giving it fresh fuel to burn. The other source of fuel for that fire would have been the sacrifices themselves. And God always required that fat from the animals be put on the altar. And that fat, I don't know if you've ever barbecued again. I know we keep going back to this idea. But I do a lot of the grilling at family events. And I tell you, my dad's grill, when it gets a little too much grease dripping down onto the grates underneath the, uh, the grills, there's a lot of flare-ups. <laughs> the fat from animals combusts. It burns. Anybody who's ever lost a little arm hair while barbecuing knows what I'm talking about. And as the, the fat from the animals would drip down as it was melting, it would fuel the fire. And the wood would fuel the fire. And I don't know if we realize how much work that must have taken <laughs> to bring that much wood to the, the tabernacle each day to make sure that that fire would never go out. You know, the, the camp of Israel, I think it's estimated was approximately about three to four square miles. And the tabernacle was at the center of it. So no matter what, if you were to go outside the camp into the forest or maybe the surrounding wooded area, wherever there might be some trees or some sort of uh, fuel that you could find, some wood, you'd have to go out there, cut it down, break it into pieces, chop it into logs, and then haul it back to the tabernacle. That takes a lot of effort. And the priests would store it and they'd use it. And once it was used, they needed more every single day. You know, God didn't say you have to have the burnt offering morning and evening every day for a year. He said it was every day continually for all of your generations. There was a constant need for fresh fuel to be provided so that the fire could continue to burn. And like I said, it was either going to be found from the fat dripping down from the sacrifice or from the offering of wood from the people. And, I, you know, I think that there's a lesson in there for us. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. He is the promise of the Father, the promised gift. And it's by his empowering that we serve God well or at all or in any sort of pleasing manner. He is the only reason that we can sing on a Sunday and it be translated into beautiful sounding songs to the Lord. It's the only reason that our, our offerings that we give at church are more than just finances, but they're considered by God to be like one of these wonderful smelling sacrifices and offerings. There's a reason why when we care for one another and love each other in the church, that God looks at that and says it's a well, a sweet aroma, well-pleasing to the Lord. You know, in the book of Philippians, Paul talks to that church and he talks about their care for him in the final chapter, chapter four. And he talks about how they provided for all of his needs and he says that that was a well, a sweet aroma to the Lord, a well-pleasing sacrifice, acceptable to God. And this idea that all they did was send Paul some supplies, it was more than that because it was fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit and it was translated into an offering. You know, the world could send money to the church. It's not an offering to God. But when you do it from the heart, a heart to serve the Lord and through the power of his spirit, it's fuel for the fire. You know, folks, I think that sometimes we forget that there's got to be fresh fuel. And actually, let's look at the next few verses and we'll get into that. <clears throat> it says in verse 10, and the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers. He shall put on his body. And take up the ashes of the burnt offering, which the fire has consumed on the altar. And he shall put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And once again, we see this concept of the fire, the, me the tending of the flame. But we see the, the sacrifices, right? I mean, common sense would say that they burned these animals. They had their grill. They made lamb chops. And they let the fire consume it all the way down until there was nothing left but ashes. 
And remember, there's a sacrifice in the morning, there's a sacrifice in the evening, and there's sacrifices and offerings in between. That's a lot of ashes. You can't just let that build up or you're not going to find the altar underneath that pile of dust. So God required that each night, or each morning, I'm sorry, each morning the priest would go. He'd put on his priestly garments, his linen garments, and he'd go in there and he'd have to shovel the ashes, make a little pile of them, change his clothes, and then bring the ashes out to a clean place outside the camp and leave them over there. And then he could go back inside and offer the, uh, the morning lamb. But you see something, guys. The fire had the power to transform that sacrifice. You know, fire actually is one of the, I don't know if it's the only thing, but it's certainly one of a few things that changes the nature of whatever it comes into contact with. And isn't that just a marvelous picture? That the Holy Spirit, when he comes in contact with us, we are changed. Our nature is changed. We are no longer walking around in our old, fleshly, uh, Adamic nature. But instead, we are renewed. We are made new creations. Our natures are completely changed. And we see that these sacrifices, just by the nature of them, they were changed into ashes. Right? What could have been used? You know, when fire is burning a piece of wood, it's not the actual wood that's burning, but there's gases being produced and released by the heat, and the gas is what is burning. And after all of the cells in that wood release the gas that they contain, there's nothing left but, but uh, char and ashes, the leftover unburnable material. And that's what we see here. These natural sacrifices, they only could be used for so long until there was really nothing left that could be burned. And I think, guys, the, the idea is the same for us. You know, we bring our, our time to the Lord. We bring our good works. We bring our prayers. Uh, and it's, that's wonderful. They are well-pleasing sacrifices to the Lord. But they don't last forever. It's not like you can pray one time or read the Bible one time. And expect that fire to continue to burn. There has to be fresh fuel in the fire. There has to be fresh sacrifice upon it to drip down and let that flame continue to burn. The Holy Spirit has to have something to work with. If you expect to see his power in your life and him to, uh, to empower what you're doing for the Lord, you have to be doing something. You have to be giving something, taking in and giving out. You know, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, it says that we're to come to Jesus as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, in Hebrews 13, 14, it says, for here we have no continuing city here in the earth. But we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Think about that. And, and then after it says, but do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You know, guys, our thanks, our praise, our sharing with one another, our, our love and our care. God looks at those things and says that is a well-pleasing sacrifice. When it is empowered by the Spirit and, and the, the transformation that He is producing in our lives and the love that He's producing in our lives, it's an offering to God. It's a burnt sacrifice. But if you think that we can just thank God once a year and that that's enough, I, I do fear that you're not going to experience his power in your life as much as he's hoping to offer it to you. God desires to work through us. He desires to have a sweet-smelling aroma arising from his church all the time, day by day, continually. And I do fear that sometimes we're content just, you know, letting the ashes smolder instead of providing a new sacrifice. Our bodies are to be sacrifices to the Lord, not abused for sensual pleasure, but given to him to use in whatever means he desires. If the Lord desired you to be physically burned at the stake, well, praise the Lord, it would be a wonderful thing. Uh, well, listen, <laughs> it wouldn't be a wonderful thing to experience, 
But in God's eyes, it would be a precious offering. Jesus offered himself for us, a sac- an offering and a sacrifice to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. It's Ephesians chapter 5. And this idea, you know, to think you never have to take in the word or you're good with what you have taken in. No, guys, the Holy Spirit needs more to work with. He wants you to be prepared that when that fire is ready to consume and be used and release his power and energy out into, to impact the lives of others, that it's there. But if you're never putting fuel in the fire or sacrifices upon the altar, there's not a whole lot left. We see here in verse 12, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. In verse 13, notice how many times now God has talked about this. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. You know, guys, the church is never meant to function outside of the empowering of God's spirit. Without him, we can do nothing. And any so-called church that tries to operate in its own strength, that's not an offering that's well-pleasing to God. I hope that here at this church, we are always offering our fullest to the Lord. We are desiring to be with him, to add fire to the wood that the Holy Spirit could consume, that we would lay our lives down as a sacrifice to the Lord, that we would, through love, care for one another and let that fuel the the fire that the Spirit is burning, letting it be a sweet aroma to the Lord. You know, as we close, I was thinking, you know, in this whole scientific uh, thought process I've been having all day about fire, (laughs) you know, how do you stop a fire? You know, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, we're told not to quench the Holy Spirit, right? And this word quench, it can be translated as extinguish. Now, listen, I don't think you can extinguish the Holy Spirit. He is, the, the, he is, he is God himself. And what are we going to do to extinguish him? It's not like we could snuff him out. And it's not like he's going to leave the believer. So I don't think that that's the concept being taught, but I think the idea when we're talking about quenching the Holy Spirit, is not allowing his power to be enabling us and working through us. And we're told not to quench him. You know, you can quench a fire. And there's three ways that I could think of, and maybe there's more, but I could think of three ways to quench a fire. One is the obvious. You throw water on it. You know, you take what does not belong in the fuel and you add it to the fire. Water doesn't burn. (laughs) Water extinguishes. And I think that that concept applies spiritually. If you are going to be adding into your life things that do not belong, that are contrary to the gospel and contrary to the desires that God has and the commands that he's given us, you're going to quench the Spirit's move in your life. You're going to quench his power working through you. You know, if you are... Uh, satisfied being drunk all the time or letting a bitterness and unforgiveness be a part of your life. You're going to add sensual pleasure and all sorts of corrupt and debased things that God tells us are the very reasons that his wrath is coming upon the world. If you're going to add those into your life, it's like adding water to a fire and the spirit will not work through you. He won't. He cannot work with sin. So that's one way. You add that which does not belong. Second, you could smother a fire, also known as choking out a fire. And the way you do that is you cut off the supply of oxygen. And you know, I, you think about that. You, you do not provide one of the components that the fire needs to burn. And I, I think, guys, you know, sometimes... We allow the cares of this world and the pleasures of life and our desires to choke out the word, to smother us, to take our focus off of the Lord and off of the word and out of prayer. And we start lacking the things that we need in order to be experiencing the move of the spirit in our hearts and his move through us into the lives of others. You can smother a fire. Finally, 
what God's been warning the priests about in Leviticus chapter 6. I think that is the third way to extinguish a fire or to quench a fire. Neglect. (laughs) Right? Think about it, guys. If the priests just put the fire there one day, God sent the flame, their job was to continue to fuel it. Well, if they they put some firewood under there and they said, all right, it's going to burn all night, wonderful. They go there in the morning and they see, all right, the sacrifice isn't dripping any fat, so that's not providing fuel. And the wood is basically all charred up. They need to put some more logs. But if they say, I'm just too tired today, I don't want to do it. I don't want to have to go carry that wood and the logs. I don't want to. Well, neglect will cause that fire to cease. And I think sometimes we do that in our lives. Just pure, outright neglect. Neglect of devotional time. Neglect of worship. Neglect of spending time in prayer. Seeking the will of the Lord. Neglect. Neglect of service. You know, when we read in Hebrews chapter 9 that Jesus uh, offered himself through the Spirit, through the eternal Spirit, you know, what fuel did Jesus provide to that fire? You think about it, Jesus carried some wood that I'm familiar with. He carried it up a hill. He was nailed to it. And the Spirit, the Spirit was upon him. And it was a well-pleasing sacrifice to God. And Jesus told us if we're going to be his disciples, we should pick up our cross and follow him too. If you're looking for some fuel for that fire that the Holy Spirit could use, why don't you try laying down your life on behalf of others, picking up that burden, carrying your cross. The Holy Spirit will empower that. (laughs) He will empower you. He will use that. It will be a sweet-smelling aroma to God. So do not quench the Spirit of God. Don't add sin Don't smother it with cares of the world. And certainly don't neglect the things that you need, the time that you need with God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and we thank you that you fill us with your precious spirit, that he is among us and in us, and that he is powerful and capable of taking all of the small things that we desire to give to you, Lord, all of these spiritual sacrifices, even just saying thank you, Lord, he is able to take that thank you and to offer it up to you. We thank you for that, Lord, that he empowers us to serve you in a, in a way that's pleasing to you. Father, I pray if there's anything in our lives that's like water to a fire, any sin, Lord, you'd remove it from us that we might not hinder or quench the spirit in any way. Father, if we are caring about the things in this world and not the things to come, where our, our citizenship and our home truly is, Lord, if we're not caring for those things, I pray you'd write our perspective and put our eyes back on heavenly things. And Lord, if we have been neglectful of spending time with you, of seeking your face, of hearing your word, Lord, we ask that you'd forgive us. And if, Lord, all that's left is the the remaining work of the Spirit is like a small ember burning, we pray you would send fresh fire into our hearts, that all that we would do would be a sweet aroma, an acceptable sacrifice to you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that because of your sacrifice, we can offer anything to the Father. Anything at all, Lord, that would be pleasing to him is because you have sanctified and redeemed us. We thank you that you are our eternal sacrifice. We praise you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church.